Eamon Khan here for seconds out with, well, as is customary when he's over in the US, Eddie Hearns. Eddie, how's life? Uh, Eddie Hearns is doing really well. He's left Eddie Hearn back home in Essex and he's absolutely buzzing to be in Las Vegas. Big card this Saturday on zone. I think we're going to get a great night. Really good night of boxing. And uh, back for Manchester next week, Jordan Gill against Zelfa Barrett. And then Haney Garcia. And then next gen in Liverpool. So a lot of travelling around, but excited and at the beautiful Fontaine Blue resort, which is a stunner. And uh, looking forward to tomorrow. Yeah, talk me through the card. Normally, what I was trying to do with you beforehand was trying to get a grade from you before and after. But as I won't get you afterwards, we'll ditch that for now. But what can fans expect to see if they're tuning in tomorrow night? Just a lot of exciting competitive fights. You know, a lot of our younger stars stepping up. I mean, we start off with Mark Castro. Big fight for him in his first championship fight. You know, he's of the same kind of mould as Raymond Ford and Diego Pacheco and Ammo Williams ready to make his mark now. Huge night for Sky Nicholson, trying to win the WBC world title off the back of three Australian defeats in America last weekend. So got to put that right. Galalia Fai has a, a really good step up against um, Augustine Gauto, who's a big puncher from Argentina. 25-1, um, and one, I think, vastly experienced compared to Galau. Diego Pacheco, who we just talked about there, I think the future at 168-pound division. Um, against McCalman and Richardson Hitchens against Lemos. The, the main event and the co-main event, 81-0 and 0 between them. So I think it's going to be a really competitive night and a chance for Richardson, who I believe ability-wise is right up there with Devin and Shakur and Tiafimo and all these guys. That If he can make a statement this week, puts himself in a great position in, you know, the, the really the flagship division, I think, right now of, of boxing and one that we're deeply invested in. Moving forward, Eddie, it seems like I'm forever pitching sit-downs with you often with other characters in sport boxing, but Ben Shalom was the latest to look to want to speak to you and, and get that meeting with you. Interest on your side? No, it's a load of rubbish, really. I mean, you know, he, he speaks to Frank Smith all the time, so he doesn't need to sit down and talk to me. Of course, I don't have a problem with it, but we know they have no interest. You know, there's been five fights that have been ordered now, not suggested, ordered, um, and they've pulled out of every one of them. So there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. You know, there's a lot of, um, oh, there's an agenda against us. There's really no agenda at all. The only agenda really is not making fights with with matchroom fighters and making sure that matchroom fighters don't feature anywhere on the Sky Sports platform. That That's the agenda. Um, but I think the fans see it. You know, we've seen with, with those five fights that I mentioned, and most recently, Adam Azim against Dalton Smith. I, I don't think they've done the wrong thing for Adam Azim. I just don't know why they've taken seven weeks to do it and sort of made a botch job of of his reputation in the meantime. Like, I think Ben's comments, yes, so why would I cash out Adam Azeem? Well, what you mean by that is, why would I put him in a fight for money that he can't win? That's fine. Just say that seven weeks ago. I don't understand why we've got to get to the deadline of a purse bid when you're messing around other people or messing around fighters when you knew you weren't fighting him. I mean... Ben Shalom text Frank Smith about a month ago saying we're not fighting Dalton Smith next. No problem. I don't have a problem with that. You you want to protect your fighters. You don't want to roll the dice. You don't want to make the big fights yet. That's fine. But we do. So, you know, I think that the five fights that were made, we would have won every one of them. So I get why they don't want to make those fights because it is, in essence, a little bit of a sort of UEFA Champions League against... You know, we're Div 2 trying to get in Div 1 and maybe in the future we can get in a championship. But obviously we fancy our chances in all these fights um, because we're elite. Do you see any of yourself in Ben Shalom in the early days? Do you, can you relate at all to some of the mistakes he may or not be making as he looks to kind of harvest his path in um, I mean, in game? terms of seeing myself in him, I'm, I mean, absolutely not in a million years. But everyone's different, aren't they? I mean, it started off, he came in, was going to be behind the scenes because they didn't want that front man that built himself through the platform, i.e. Eddie Hearn. That changed quite quickly. And I think it's important to have that front man. I think it's good that he's come out now and he's, you know, I know he doesn't make himself as accessible as I do, but sometimes that's to my detriment. But I feel like that's my responsibility as a promoter to discuss my fighters, build their profiles, interact with the fans, interact with the media. And I've always been pretty transparent in that I'll sit down with anyone and you can ask me what you want. You know, I don't tell people what they can and can't ask and not, you know, no Dalton Smith, no Wardley, no this, no that. It's just ask me what you want. And um, you're going to make a lot. Look, he's done well. You know, I'm not, he's picked up a very lucrative contract. Um, and things take time. 
Like when we left Sky, they were making an absolute fortune out of boxing. And obviously now they're losing a lot of money in boxing. But it's just a transitional period. And it's very important that Sky stay in boxing because they're a fantastic platform and they're a huge asset to sports. We've seen it in boxing. We've seen it ourselves with darts. They've, they've helped us make darts a global sensation. And they helped build matchroom boxing and myself. So I just wish that they'd acknowledge that there's another world out there like they did when I was there. You know, like when Chef Clark gets asked to do an interview and they just cut the feed immediately because there's a matchroom fighter on set. It's like, it doesn't have to be like that. But I get it. It's still a little bit tender. Um, but, you know, very important to boxing that Sky stay in the game. So hopefully they can continue or find some success. I've seen some recent comments from Anthony Joffrey stating that he's putting a timeline on his career retiring in two years' time. I imagine you'll shed a small tear or two when that day comes. Um, what do you think of that timeline? Yeah, I think sometimes when you get to this stage in your career, you get pressed for a timeline. It's very difficult to give one, and it's never definitive. It's all built around where you are on that given moment. Right now, he's in the best position I think he's ever been in, in his career in terms of his physical mind, his ability, his mental state. So it's really exciting. And I think his best times are ahead of him. But if you think about a two-year period, I mean, he's just boxed four times in 11 months. So two years is probably six fights. That's about right. I mean, I, you know, what else is there to do? And, and if I said to AJ, who do you want to fight before you retire? I think he'd say Fury, Usyk, Wilder, Zhang, Parker, Hergovic. Maybe a Dubois if he got a couple. Of, so that's about right. What else is there to do? You know, but the uh, the aim is to regain the heavyweight world championship and ultimately become the undisputed champion of the world, which I, I really believe he will do. Which one of those is next in September if that's the target date? Ab absolutely no one. I mean, I've seen various reports. I mean, I do think his next fight will be for a world title or be for the undisputed championship. But he wants to fight in July. But, you know, I've seen reports of September. There's there's absolutely nothing confirmed yet in terms of the next steps for Anthony Joshua. May the 18th is a big focus. You know, we're going to be watching hard and I'll be there to to watch another, you know, historic night in Riyadh. And, and we'll see what happens after that. But as I said, I do believe his next fight will be for the World Heavyweight Championship or ideally, but we understand they have two fights, the Undisputed Championship. A lot of people kind of in the industry feel like when Joshua kind of moves out of the picture, you'll sort of sail off in the sunset and have your happily ever after as well. Uh, Any truth in that? No, I did always say to AJ that I would leave the game with him. Mm. And I, I think that's very unlikely, unfortunately for me. Um, I'm totally addicted to the sport, to the business. I'd hate to let anyone win by leaving. And I have to be careful because as good as Frank Smith is over there, he's still got a couple of years to develop but he might want to get out as well. I mean, he's the worst business in the world, but it is also the most fun you could ever have. Like when you get those nights, when you create those events, when you see the look on a fighter's face, which is a look of a, a dream they've always um, wished of achieving and, and financially changing their life forever, there's nothing like it. So um, yeah, unfortunately, I won't be retiring with Anthony Joshua. Unless he goes on till he's 40 or so, then you never know. I spoke to Usyk yesterday. I don't know if you managed to catch any, catch any clips of it. Um, I posed a question to him where Joshua was asked by the BBC, or he, would, he spoke to the BBC, and he said, look, um, I passed on to Klitschko to apologise to Usyk after I took the mic, and I was defeated by Usyk. And that's been passed off. Usyk accepted that apology. Do you, do you think that was something that AJ maybe needed to apologise for? No, not really. I, you know, I think... Um... When you're under the microscope like that and you dream, your dreams come crumbling down and you've been punched in the head for 12 rounds by a pound for pound great, you're never going to be compass mentis, are you, to exactly get it right in terms of what you do? Mm -hmm. It was very out of character of Anthony Joshua, but it was just an expression of the pressure that was on his shoulders. And I feel like he needed to relieve that pressure. So what happened that night and actually what happened at the press conference after, I think was important for his personal development to share those feelings and to show people that everyone's human. And just because he might look like a superhero in a pair of trunks, you know, he still has mental health, you know, like everybody else. And, and I think that was a low time for him in his career. And like I said, the turnaround now to where he is right now, is what makes me so happy. I, 
I see a happy Anthony Joshua, someone that's in, really enjoying his boxing and his life. And um, that's all you ever want. So he's the kind of guy that if he knows he's, you know, an apology should be made, he will make it. But he's not the kind of guy to issue a statement to the world. He will do it personally. And he will do it. He will make sure that, you know, it's, it's been received. Last couple of things from me, Eddie. How are the negotiations with Deontay Wilder going? None, really. I mean, I've seen all these rumours. I, mean, You know, for me, we have two heavyweights to pick for April uh, the 15th press conference for the June uh, show. Obviously, Philip Hergovic is worked with Matchroom and, and you know, he's he's a likely pick. We know that. But I have the opportunity to pick from our stable or, as His, ex his Excellency said, to also potentially sign a wild card for the night, not for their career, but for the night. And it needs to be, in my opinion, the best heavyweight I can find. And I think Deontay Wilder is one of the best heavyweights out there still. I think he's dangerous. I think he has plenty of legs left in the sport. So I can't tell you that hasn't crossed my mind. But we'll see on April the 15th who the man in the mask will be when all is revealed. And there's probably conversations with five heavyweights for that wild card slot right now. So it's going to be a big one. Can you say what happens if someone gets injured? Are there replacements or replacement fights at different weights? Can yeah, you say anything cool. to that? No, no. I mean, if, if someone gets injured, then really you've got to find another fighter, you know? And um, if you haven't got a fighter in that division, you better find one. Because, that's you know, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, go on. You, you answer. No, that's it. Uh, lastly, for me, Eddie, six weeks out from the undisputed bout, um, one piece of advice from you to each fighter, what would you say to them? What? In camp? On the night? What? You know. However you want to answer it. Just go and achieve your dreams. You know, it's the ultimate prize in boxing. The undisputed championship, the flagship division in the sport in terms of profile. Um, I can't wait. You know, I've worked with Usyk for a long time. Not anymore. But I think he's a great guy. And I think Alex Krasik's a great guy. Igis Klimas. Um... I'm quite fond of Tyson Fury, despite our disputes over the years. And he's British, so I'm 100% Team Fury for this one. But I wish them all the best. And uh, I'm sure they'll be in the ring on May the 18th, giving Riyadh, Saudi Arabia and the world a historic night for the sport. Eddie, pleasure speaking to you. Thanks for being out. Catch up soon. Cheers, guys.